Street. And so ordered. The Honourable Member for Carl 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 today. Thank you. Thank you is the, ther- is the key expression of my speech today. I was in a coffee shop recently, and I bought a cup of coffee, and I said thank you to the barista serving it. And she said, thank you back, not you're welcome. I thought that was a particularly bizarre, because we're taught from childhood that the sequence is supposed to be thank you, you're welcome, not thank you, thank you. But then I realized as I went around that this double thank you happens all the time when I'm buying or selling goods. And I finally stumble upon an explanation from the economist Stephen Horowitz as to why this double thank you occurs. Because in a free market economy, whenever you buy something or sell something, you have something that is worth more to you than what you had before. If I have an apple and want an orange, and you have an orange and want an apple, we trade, we still have an apple and orange between us, but we're both richer because we both have something that's worth more to us than what we had before. How do we know that? Because the exchange was voluntary. Neither of us was forced to trade the apple for the orange. We each did it by volition because we wanted the product that the other person had. Every exchange in a free market economy, literally every single one, without exception, is based on voluntary exchange. Labor for wages, investment for return, payment for product. In each case, the buyer and the seller offer what they have voluntarily. By contrast, every single transaction done by government is done by force. Even legitimate, desirable transactions. We all agree the government should fund an armed forces to keep us all safe. We all understand that if left to themselves, citizens might not voluntarily donate enough money to marshal such a force. So we believe the government has a role in compelling taxation in order to fund what is, in effect, a public good that we all require and from which we all benefit. But surely we should also agree that the use of that force should be limited to cases where it is absolutely unavoidable and necessary. And we should not expand government into areas that people can decide upon and act out on their own volition. But the government continually does get involved in areas that are easily done through voluntary exchange. In fact, it replaces free choice with force so very often. This government has done that. And they claim that the need for government intervention in the economy is to protect the weak from the strong. That's a strange way of looking at the world. Since when? Does expanding coercion help the weak? Relationships of force typically favor the strong. Let me give you a counterexample. An 18-year-old young, youngster walks into an Apple store in order to consider buying an iPad. Now this young man is worth about $1,000. He earned it on his summer job mowing lawns. The company he's dealing with is worth $878 billion dollars, almost a trillion dollars. He is negotiating with the most powerful company in the world, almost a trillion dollars in size. How could that negotiation ever be fair? The answer is voluntary exchange. They cannot get his thousand dollars for an iPad unless they prove to him that it's worth more than the money he has to part with to get it. By contrast, he can't get the iPad unless he can convince Apple that the $1,000 is worth, worth more to the company than is the product they have to part with in order to get it. In other words, this system of voluntary exchange takes the most powerful company in the world and lowers its power to the level of an 18-year-old with barely enough money in his bank account to pay for a tablet. Now, imagine they entered a different universe government. If Apple decided it wanted a subsidy from government, paid for by the taxes of that young man, I'm afraid Apple would have a heck of a lot more power in making that decision come about, because the government, which would use force to collect the money to subsidize the company, Apple, in that scenario, 
can hire an army of lobbyists, can make political donations, can influence public opinion, whereas that poor young guy is too busy mowing lawns in order to have the same political power. And therefore, when government is in control of the economy, the bigger, the stronger, and the more powerful forces always get ahead. They can use money to acquire political power and political power to acquire yet more money. And that is why countries with big governments typically have much more poverty and much bigger gaps between rich and poor. This government is expanding itself into areas not necessary for governments to be involved in. Let me give you some examples. The Prime Minister said he, hadn't, he, he was going to determine how much Canadians would choose to invest in Bombardier. Well, in the end, he didn't give them any choice. He decided for them. He gave $400 million of taxpayers' money to this company, which is able to invest a fortune in lobbying. That $400 million was in part used to boost the salaries of the billionaire executives by 50 per cent, while 14,000 workers got laid off. Or there's the Infrastructure Bank, which will give $15 billion worth of loans and loan guarantees to wealthy investors who, in, who are contributing to mega pro infrastructure mega projects. This will ensure that if the project succeeds, the private investor will make money, but if it fails, the taxpayer will take all the loss. And again, this is a financial arrangement that no one of those taxpayers would voluntarily enter into. After all, what do they get? A big pile of losses. But because the powerful interest that lobbied the government at the Shangri-La Hotel, where a summit was held of private equity investors, was able to convince the government to force taxpayers into that economic relationship. They are, again, favoring those who have political power over everyone else. And then there's the Asian Infrastructure Bank we just learned about. Right, It's inside this very bill. $500 million, a half a billion dollars of Canadian tax dollars will be invested in this new uh, uh, foreign-run uh, infrastructure bank to build infrastructure in faraway overseas lands. Who in Canada would ever buy shares in a bank that pays that will never pay any dividends and will only ever offer loans and loan guarantees to wealthy investors? Who will take advantage of it in the event that their projects go under? But if those projects make money, and if they profit, well, those borrowers, again, wealthy investors and construction companies on, a, in, on other continents, they will get all the profit. So if they got all the profit, taxpayers get all the loss. Again, no one would voluntarily enter into such a transaction. Or there's something called super clusters. The government has a billion dollar fund that it's going to hand out to wealthy, uh, high-tech investors who will then use those subsidies to pay themselves exorbitant salaries and are not necessarily expected to earn any of the money in their, on themselves because they are able to, to get their revenues and their capital from ta taxpayers who are not voluntary participants. Here in Ontario, we had the Green Energy Act, where people were forced to pay 90 cents for a kilowatt hour that's only worth 2.5 cents. Now, we know no free person would decide to pay 90 cents for something that's worth 2.5 cents. And who won? Of course, the wealthy investors who turned themselves into multi-millionaires with this enormous wealth transfer, and who lost, of course, the poor, the working class, the people whose power bills doubled in order to fund this monstrous wealth transfer from working class to super elite. Mr. Speaker, in all these cases, the government is using coercion and force to appropriate more and more of the economy and favor those who have the most political power. And all of those people are rich. So when the government claims that it's expanding, the it's expanding its power and control over the economy to help the less fortunate, I ask at the very least, this House look upon such claims with great skepticism, and instead that this House should favour the free market, where people are judged on their merits, on their contributions, and on the voluntary exchange of goods and services that requires 
of every single person who wants to get to head, get ahead to offer someone else something worth more to them than what it costs. That is the free market. That is true empathy. And that is the way that we build a just and prosperous society. Thank you. Here, here.